Good morning, Professor. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. Um, you don't consider yourself an expert in the history of marriage in countries outside the United States, correct? Since I place a fairly high bar on what is expertise, the answer is yes. Uh, so, so you're not an expert in the history of marriage outside the United States? Not in my own terms, no. And you are not familiar with the institution of marriage in the most populated countries on the planet, China and India, correct? Somewhat familiar. Well, let's look at what you said during your deposition in the Iowa case, uh, and that's tab two of your witness binder, and I'd like to direct your attention to page 55. Lines 12 through 14. Uh, page 55 is under tab two, is that right? Yes. Professor. I see. Yeah. Oh, I need my reading glasses for this. Uh, which page? Uh, 55. It's in the upper right-hand mm -hmm. corner. Mm -hmm. And in line 12, you were asked, are you familiar with the institution of marriage in the most populated countries on the planet, China and India? And you answered, no, not really. I mean, no. The consequences of same-sex marriage is an impossible question to answer, yes or no. You're asking me to say yes or no? I am. Uh, right. I believe no one predicts the future that accurately. And you're not uh, an expert on marriage practices in ancient Greece, correct? I am not an expert on that. I'm somewhat familiar with it. You uh, think gays and lesbians should have the right to marry, correct? I have come to that view from my research and study of the history of marriage, yes. And you feel that you're somewhat between a neutral party and an advocate, correct? I would call myself not an advocate, but someone who has come to a personal opinion as a result of my historical research and study of this matter of the history of marriage for quite a number of years now. Let's see what you said during your Iowa deposition. Uh, that's the next page, page 59, top of the page, lines one through four. You said, so I feel I'm somewhat between a neutral party and an advocate in that I feel I'm led by my particular historical exper expertise to feel that this is the direction. Now, you've um, put in amicus briefs and signed on to amicus briefs in New York, New Jersey, and Washington State, is that correct? Historians briefs, that is right. And you weren't compensated for your work in those cases, were you? I was not. Okay. And you volunteered your time because you view this as an important civil rights issue, correct? I volunteered my time because I think it's very important for historians to contribute to public policy discussions. I'd like to direct your attention to tab four of your binder. And this is the Alternatives to Marriage Project. It's the annual report of 2002. And I'd like to direct your attention to page 13. the upper right-hand column, it, it lists donors to this organization and it lists the Nancy Cott. And is that you? Did you contribute to the Alternative to Marriage Project? It's possible. I don't recall. It's possible. Okay. Uh, let, let's turn to uh, page four of this report, to the mission statement of the Alternatives to Marriage Project, uh, and, and it states that this organization advocates for equality and fairness for unmarried people, including people who choose not to marry, cannot marry, or live together before marriage, a and you support that mission, don't you? I do. And in the uh, third sentence of that paragraph, it states, we believe that marriage is only one of many acceptable family forms and that society should recognize and support healthy relationships in all their diversity. And you support that mission statement, don't you? 
And a polyamorous family is one in which there are three or more adults who are in the family group. Is that correct? I don't know. At the time I signed this statement, I had never heard the term polyamory. Have you heard it since? I have heard it since. What is your understanding of polyamory? My understanding happens to come from an article that was in the Boston Globe about a week ago, and that was really my education on what it is. And apparently it's a network of people who are in multiple but stable relationships. And let's turn to page six of this annual report to the final bullet point on the page, which reads, and this was written, of course, before the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts had ruled, so it's a little dated, but it said, same-sex couples are denied the right to marry in every state. Others are also unable to marry, including those in relationships of more than two people. And so is it your understanding, and do you support the concept that rights and benefits should be extended to polyamorous families? No. Did you support it at the time when you gave money to this organization? I wasn't aware of it. I knew the couple, the heterosexual couple who founded this organization. They had started it around the time I was publishing my book, and they were mainly interested, and their organization was started, to give credit to those heterosexuals who wanted to live in stable unions without marrying. And I think the right to marry should be accompanied by an emphasis that one does not have to marry if one doesn't want to. And it was from that angle that I supported this young heterosexual couple who had been pressured by their families to marry, and they didn't want to enter the institution. And turning to tab six in your binder, this is an affirmation of family diversity, and it's part of the Alternatives to Marriage Project. And turning to that third page in your binder behind tab six, do you see the second line that says, Nancy Cott, History and American Studies, Yale University? And it's not in my binder. No, I see the view signatures here, but I don't see any names. Not in my binder either, Counsel. Okay. Well, maybe we can pull that up on a screen. But regardless, do you recall this document and having signed on to it? I do. You do? I do. Okay. And you supported the contents of this document, or you wouldn't have signed it? Yes, that all healthy families should be supported by social views, yes. And you shared the concern that was referenced at the end of the first paragraph. What worries us is the mistaken notion that marriage is the only acceptable relationship or family structure. You supported that view? Yes, I did. And you think couples should keep a skeptical stance on marriage, correct? I've ever made that point. Well, maybe I did. It's possible I said that somewhere in passing. All right. Let's refresh your recollection, turning to behind tab three. This is an interview that you provided with a Priscilla Gaiman. Do you remember this interview? Vaguely. Okay. And turning to the fourth page of the interview. Just one paragraph. It's seventh line down says, I'd also say couples should keep a skeptical stance on marriage. Did you believe that at the time you made that statement? I can't really recall. And this, I never had an opportunity to check the transcript of the interview before she put it up on the web. So I really can't affirm whether or not I said this at the time. Public authorities are very interested in making sure that as few people as possible 
are assigned to public sources of funds for their support, correct? Yes or no? I think that tends to be the case, yes. Throughout American history, legislatures and courts, in other words, the public apparatus in general, has been very, very interested in making sure that dependent children will be supported by their parents. Yes or no? That has definitely been a motivation of state authorities, yes. One of the purposes of marriage today is to assign providers to care for dependents, including children, and to limit the public's liability to care for the vulnerable, correct? Yes. And one of the purposes that marriage has served over this country's history is to create stable families, correct? Yes. That's Another Another purpose that marriage has served over this country's history is to assign providers to care for dependents, including the very young, correct? Yes, you asked me that already. And one of the purposes of the institution of marriage is to ensure that children are raised by their natural mother and father, correct? No, oh, I wouldn't say that. Another one of the purposes that marriage has served over this country's history is to legitimate children, correct? Yes, but as I said, uh, that le legitimation function is less important now. Uh, you talked in your direct about laws prohibiting interracial marriage. Isn't it true that those laws required that children of an interracial couple be born out of wedlock? In effect, it created Ill illegitimate sex out of, uh, out of cross-racial relationships, yes. And illegitimate children. Too. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Any, any results in children. Yeah. And the laws banning interracial marriage created barriers to the establishment of legal ties connecting mother, father, and child, correct? I wouldn't say they created barriers to legal ties. They simply did not create legal ties or, or, or legal obligations the way that legal marriage did. Now, let's turn to the history of laws prohibiting interracial marriage. The first slaves arrived in this country in 1619, correct? I believe so. Okay. And, and uh, the first law banning interracial marriage was in 1691 in Virginia, correct? No, that is not correct. When was the first law banning interracial marriage in the United States? Well, it wasn't phrased precisely with the word marriage, but a law was passed in the colonial Chesapeake in 1667 that punished shameful matches, as they said, between free white women and Negroes. And that, so shameful matches were, those were the words, but it's clear that the intent was to penalize and criminalize marriages. Now let's look at the time of the founding of this country in 1789 and, and at the original uh, 13 states. It's true that New York never has had a law prohibiting interracial marriage, correct? I can't say I know absolutely for sure, but it's very plausible that it has never had one. And Pennsylvania has never had a law prohibiting interracial marriage, correct? Frankly, I don't know this colony by colony. Uh, I, I, you know. New Jersey has never had a law prohibiting interracial marriage, correct? In the entire state's history? Correct. Um, well, I, I haven't rechecked every state for the purposes of this report, so I, I can't confirm or disconfirm what you're saying about those three states. So you, you have no idea whether the majority of states at the founding of the country did not have a prohibition on interracial marriage? That is an irrelevant question, really. Because no, I, I, you, on redirect, you no. can give a speech. It's okay. yes or no okay. now. Thanks. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, so you don't I, I know don't, what the I don't know are. precisely how many of the original 13 colonies had such laws. Okay. But it's fair to say there was never a uniform legal prohibition on interracial marriage throughout the United States, correct? It is true that there was never a time that a couple could not go to some state and marry across the color line. That's correct. And bans on marriage across the color lines were measures designed to maintain white supremacy, correct? They were never seen so at the time they were passed. They were seen so in 1967, but not until then. I'd like to ask you some questions about the importance of marriage to society. Uh, in the Western world, when you look at any new government that 
government that has been formed, especially through revolution, one of the first things that is done is the formulation of the marital policy that will accord with this form of government, correct? I find the witness's testimony to the United States. Now you're going abroad. Well, uh, I'd be happy Are to strike all, all of her testimony about anything outside the United States. That's fine. That's a, I, I appreciate that, Your Honor. Uh, I, we, we, I will focus uh, a little more carefully on the United States. Uh, the, the institution of marriage in the United States requires public affirmation, correct? Public witness, public license, if that's what you mean. Public affirmation. Well, public affirmation. The stamp of the state, yes. And uh, as the courts consider whether to redefine marriage so that it is no longer the union of one man and one woman, you would agree that this is a very important point to mark in the evolution of marriage, yes or no? What is a very important point? As the courts consider whether to redefine marriage so that it is no longer the union of one man and one woman, you would agree that this is a very important point to mark in the evolution of marriage, correct? And although marriage has always been a changing institution and one could point to earlier watersheds, perhaps there is none quite so explicit as this particular turning point, correct? I would argue about that. Uh well, you, you remember you gave an interview to NPR uh, after as when the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, Supreme uh, of Massachusetts, was uh, poised to rule. Do you recall that uh, in April of 2004? Not, in fact. All right. Well, I, I'd like to play you an excerpt from that, see if it refreshes your recollection. We need to switch, I think, the uh, monitor. Oh, it's, a, it, it's not an exhibit. It's just something to. Oh, okay. Before I Well, uh, as the witness has proven, she uh, is very eloquent and fulsome in her answers. I believe it's a 20-minute interview. But uh, I just want to play it to refresh her recollection. And, uh, and well, uh, on redirect, uh, we're happy to give you the link. You can listen to it at the break and play the whole thing on redirect if you like. Well, let, let's, let's just see the portion of the interview that you're seeking to refresh the witness's recollection with. We, we I don't see. Well, well, let's uh, just uh, take this one step at a time. Mr. Thompson, the uh, portion of the interview that uh, that you uh, wish to show to the witness. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Ah, okay. Now we're, I think, uh, ready to go. Way. Start at the I think it's a, it's a very the, important let's point at, to mark yeah. in the evolution. Let's start at the beginning with the volume so that everybody can hear it, including the witness, most important. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Another who is married. They're distinct in this more impalpable and symbolic way. You're a historian. Do you feel like history is about to be made one way or another, uh, either in the legalization of uh, same-sex marriage or in the official illegalization of it? Yes, I think it's a, it's a very important point to mark in the evolution of marriage. I, I do think marriage has always been a changing institution, and one could point to earlier watersheds, but perhaps it's none quite so explicit as this particular turning point. And um, as a historian, are you taking an activist role on this in any way? Well, I, I don't 
Right. Uh, does that refresh? That, that was you. Uh, on I mean, that, that sounded like a good sentence. I'd like <laughs> to hear that, that next thing. All right. That, uh, Mr. Thompson, go ahead. Okay. Um, pr professor, was that you? Uh, uh, was that your voice that we just played? Yes. And did it refresh your recollection that you had done an NPR interview? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, do you agree with the statement you made there, which is one could point to earlier watersheds, but perhaps none quite so explicit as this particular turning point? Do you agree with that statement? As I said there, perhaps, and that was how I responded to you, that one could argue about this, but it, it's arguably uh, a, a, a highly distinctive turning point. As a historian, you do not assume that progress is the rule of history, correct? Correct. Marriage is a very complex institution, correct? There is a long, ongoing series of arguments among historians, competing theories about how we find the causes of any major phenomenon, correct? Yes. Some historians prefer to wait ideas, correct? Others prefer to weight economic factors, correct? Yes. Uh, some uh, uh, weigh pure contingency of how things occur, correct? Give it more weight, yes. But to you, the most reasonable historical explanation gives some weight to all of these factors so that none of them operates solely on its own, correct? I'd like to turn your attention to tab nine in your witness binder. This is uh, DIX 1434. It's a law review article uh, from the Virginia Law Review entitled, We Will Get What We Ask For, Why Legalizing Gay and Lesbian Marriage Will Not Dismantle the Legal Structure of Gender in Every man uh, Marriage. And it's authored by Nancy D. Polikoff. Um, the, the UVA Law Review is a well-regarded uh, publication. I can't affirm or disconfirm that. I, I, I assume so, but I don't really know. Uh, and, and Nancy Polikoff is uh, openly gay and an advocate for gay rights. Is that right? I don't know. She's a professor at American University. Do you know that? I'm not familiar with her. OK. I'd, I'd like to turn your attention to uh, page 1536 to the uh, second full paragraph, which reads, the only argument that has ever tempted me to support efforts to obtain lesbian and gay marriage is the contention that marriages between two men or two women would inherently transform the institution of marriage for all people. Is it true that there are some people who subscribe to the view that Professor Polikoff has articulated? She does, or she thinks there is. I, I, I Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1434. Your Honor, this goes to our one of our contentions that we've spoken to before about legislative facts and the and the Ninth Circuit's ruling in Marshall versus Sawyer, in which they said legislative facts relate to public policy or questions of law. And the Supreme Court, from Brown versus Board of Education to Roe versus Wade to Grutter to Lawrence, in every single one of those big ticket cases, has looked at precisely these types of law review articles for the truth of the matter asserted. And we uh, maintain that all of this evidence, just as uh, they wanted to move an entire book into the record that it, we are entitled to put into the record in this court, uh, these types of articles in, in publications that pertain on a key issue, which is what are the consequences potentially of same-sex marriage? And, and uh, yes. Well, the court certainly can take judicial notice of what's published in law reviews and I can certainly do that. Uh, this is a law review, Howard, written by another individual. Uh, the witness has stated that she's not familiar with uh, either the article or the author. So I'll certainly take judicial notice of it. It can be included in the uh, record if you like. Uh, the record is as it is. 
Thank you, Your Honor, and that's that's all we're asking for. We appreciate that. All right. Okay. L let's. That's going to be. Um, we better have it marked. Is oh, it, it, it previously it, marked. It, it is marked. Y yes, Your As Honor. As exhibit. DDIX uh, 1434. 1434. All right. Very well. And uh, we, we'd like to uh, turn your attention to the next tab, which is uh, DIX 1020. Uh, and this is a article in the Chapman Journal of Law and Policy. Uh, it's uh, dated 2008-9 by a Jeffrey Redding. Uh, are you familiar with Professor Redding? I've never heard of him. Okay. He, he taught at Harvard and Yale, so I thought perhaps you had overlapped. But uh, he's now at the, at the University of St. Louis Law School. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to page seven of this article. To the paragraph, um, it's the third full paragraph from the bottom, um, and, and it reads, the gay and lesbian civil rights movement insists that marriage is the proper province of secular states instead of churches and temples, and its insistence that marriage can incorporate fertile same-sex couplings just as readily as it can sterile opposite-sex couples is a further testament to this movement's deep-seated desire to challenge the conventional meanings of words and concepts. Do you agree that allowing same-sex marriage would challenge the conventional meaning of marriage? I believe it would amplify the conventional meaning of marriage. Your Honor, we would ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1020. Very well. Uh, turning to uh, the next tab in your binder, uh, Professor, which is DIX 1033. Uh, and this is a, a book entitled All of Our Families, New Policies for a New Century uh, by the published by the Oxford University Press. That's a pretty prestigious press, is it not? Yes, it is. And uh, turning to the fourth page of your binder, which is page one, it has 144 at the bottom, shows that this is an article by uh, Judith Stacy entitled Gay and Lesbian Families Queer Like Us. And P Professor Stacy is uh, a professor of sociology at NYU, is that right? I know she's a professor of sociology. I'm not sure where she teaches right now. She's a supporter of uh, gay and lesbian rights. Is that right? I don't know. Um, turning to page 155 of this document, she states, um, at the top of the page in the first full paragraph, Despite the paucity of mainstream political enthusiasm for legalizing gay marriage, there are good reasons to believe that gays and lesbians will eventually win this right and to support their struggle to do so. Legitimizing marriage and lesbian marriage, gay and lesbian marriages would promote a democratic, pluralist expansion of the meaning, practice, and politics of family life in the United States, helping to supplant the destructive sanctity of the family with respect for diverse and vibrant families. Do you agree with Professor Stacy? Your Honor, I'm going to object again. This is just argument from an article. I beg your pardon. I'm going to object. This is simply argument from an article that does not have anything to do with Professor well, I, th I think it's appropriate for counsel to place before the witness propositions that uh, have been factual propositions of this kind that have been asserted by individuals who have expressed views on the subject and ask whether or not she agrees or disagrees with the statement. And I think that's what counsel is doing. And uh, I think it's an appropriate form of examination. Very well. Proceed, I, Mr. Th Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. And we'd ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1033. Well. Uh, professor, turning to the next tab in your binder, which is uh, tab 12, and this is entitled Ethics. I'm not sure you got an answer to the question with respect oh. to 1033. Mr. Thompson, <laughs> maybe, maybe you agree you... with uh, Professor Stacy's position? The, the sentence that begins legitimizing gay and lesbian marriages is what you're asking about on page 155? Yes, the one that will supplant the destructive sanctity of the family. This is a, 
a statement of her opinion, and I think that it's a plausible line of reasoning, but I, it's a, it's a prediction, and so I, I'm right, really rather neutral on it. Okay. Uh, let's turn to tab 12, which is uh, entitled Ethics in the Public Domain, Essays in the Morality of Law and Politics by Joseph Raz, and, and Professor Raz is a prominent philosopher, is that right? I really do not know. Okay. Uh, this was published by the Oxford University Press. Do you see that at the bottom of the, this first page? Clarendon Press in Oxford, yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, turning your attention to uh, page 23 of this article, let me know when you're there. Okay. And the first full paragraph, uh, the last two sentences read, when people demand recognition of gay marriages, they usually mean to demand access to an existing good. In fact, they also ask for the transformation of that good, for there can be no doubt that the recognition of gay marriages will affect as great a transformation in the nature of marriage as that from polygamous to monogamous or from arranged to unarranged marriage. Do you agree with that statement? I do not. Your Honor, we ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1444. Very well. Uh, Professor, I'd like you to turn to your next tab in the binder, which is uh, an article by uh, E.J. Graff entitled Retying the Knot uh, in the Nation, and it's DIX 1445. And uh, do, do you know uh, E.J. Graff? I have been acquainted with her briefly in the past. She, she's at Brandeis University, is that right? I don't know. I knew her uh, number. 12, 14 years ago, and she was not at Brandeis, but I don't know where she is now. Okay. Well, where was she when you knew her, if you recall? Journalist trying to write a book. Okay. Uh, and turning to uh, the, the first sentence of this, it says, the right wing gets it. Same-sex marriage is a breathtakingly subversive idea. Do you agree with that statement? No. Oh. All right, Your Honor, we ask the court to take judicial notice of DIX 1445. Well. And, and E.J. Graft is a supporter of the rights of gays and lesbians. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. I'm not current with her thinking. You don't have any views on what are the factors that have affected the divorce rate in Massachusetts since same-sex marriage was legalized, correct? Correct. All right, let's look at your deposition, page 199. It's behind tab one. And uh, are you there, Professor? This is the deposition in Iowa or the deposition? Oh, sorry, Your Honor. Uh, this is the one in this case, which is behind tab one. I the, have I, the deposition. I, I put it in the witness binder as well. So Iowa is behind tab two, and the what? deposition in this case is behind tab one. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> 199? Y yes, Your Honor. And... Uh, Professor, do you, do you see on line five where I I'm have sorry, what page? 199. 199. Okay. Okay, and on line five, I asked you, what are the factors that have affected divorce rates in Massachusetts over the last five years, in your opinion? Objection, objection calls for speculation, vague, beyond the scope of this report. Answer, I don't have any views on what are the factors that have affected the divorce rate in Massachusetts. I raised this in the report mainly because the reports I was rebutting seemed to connect frequency of divorce to 
in a group of negative factors affecting current social life that they think a same-sex marriage would contribute further to. And so I mentioned that not as a result of the fact that there is same-sex marriage, but just as a concomitant phenomenon that is worthy of notice. You, you gave that testimony? I did. I could clarify the difference between what I responded to you verbally and what says, is said here, but I can re refrain from that as well. I'd like to ask you to turn to tab 17 in your binder, uh, which is uh, DIX uh, 1028. Uh, it's an article by Monty Stewart entitled Marriage Facts. And I'd like you, Professor, to turn to page 327, the first full paragraph. And it says, a fundamental purpose of marriage, then, is to situate heterosexual passion within a social institution that will, to the largest extent, practical extent, assure that the consequences of procreative passion, namely children, begin and continue life with adequate private welfare. Although the immediate objects of the protective aspects of this private welfare purpose are the child and the often vulnerable mother, society itself is the ultimate beneficiary. Do you agree that society itself is the ultimate beneficiary of marriage? I, I think that's a, a very difficult question to answer, yes or no, without uh, uh, not really giving my complete opinion. The, the question is posed in such a way that I can't really answer it honestly, yes or no. Uh, Your Honor, we'd ask the um, court to take judicial notice of DIX 1028. Very well. And you were reading from page? Uh, 327, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, professor, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 18, your binder, which is uh, DIX 1475. It's an article that appeared on September 19th, 2008 in the Los Angeles Times by our expert in this case, David Blankenhorn. Uh, he starts by saying, uh, I'm a liberal Democrat and I do not favor same-sex marriage. Do those positions sound contradictory? To me, they fit together. And then turning to the uh, second to last paragraph of this uh, article, he, he uh, states, here is my reasoning. I reject homophobia and believe in the equal dignity of gay and lesbian love because I also believe with all my heart in the right of the child to the mother and father who made her. I believe that we as a society should seek to maintain and to strengthen the only human institution, marriage, that is specifically intended to safeguard that right and make it real for our children. Professor, is there any other social institution in this country as important to children as marriage? I think families are important to children. They do not have to be marital families. They often are. Uh, but I can't agree with the approach of Blankenhorn's statements here, which imply that the biological link between parents and children is the necessary foundation of uh, marriage and why it's good for society. Do you think the biological connection between parents and children is irrelevant to the uh, social well-being of children? I do not think it's irrelevant. Okay. I don't think it's comprehensive in describing what is good for children. Okay. Now, I asked you whether you thought there was a, a social institution in this country as important to children as marriage, and you answered, well, their families are important. Do you consider families a social institution? Okay. And I'd like to direct your attention back, I apologize for flipping around, but to tab 16 for a moment, uh, which is uh, from the CDC. Oh, oh I, I should have said, Your Honor, I, I'd ask that you take a judicial notice of DIX 1475. That'll be fine. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. And I think the same for 1028. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Um, May I ask uh, uh, Judge Walker? You, uh, all right. I think maybe this would be a good time to take a break. I, I would like to have a break. Please, all right. Uh, that's not a bad idea. I suspect you're not the only one. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, sorry for the interruption, counsel. Why don't we take until 1030, and then we'll resume with further uh, cross-examination of this you. witness. Thank you.